Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so we are uh, we are in a in a it's kind of a sub series. Uh, our family matters, talking about uh, about love, and I think we all could, would agree that that we all could use some uh, lessons on becoming better lovers in our life. And so that's what this series is about. And I hope that, uh, of course, we had a break last week, but I hope that you know as we continue this series that it is helpful to you, that you, that you uh, uh, grow through it, um, and that you, uh, you know, even on your own, um, read through the different texts and different things and look back through your notes because love is what it's all about. That's why I kind of want them to sing that uh, song again at the end. And so we are looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Specifically, uh, starting in uh, verse 4, where it says, and we talked about the first week, uh, or the first week we talked about anger, but then love is patient and love is kind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle back to love is kind. Um, and then today, it, the Bible says, and it does not envy. It does not envy. And I, I really wanted to, rather than do kind, I really wanted to tackle this before, uh, you know, before I, well, we're, we're going away, but, but you know, before I even moved on. And here's why. I believe that envy, you know, it's one of the seven deadly sins they call it, but I believe envy is, uh, is responsible for so, uh, so many problems, uh, if, not, if not every problem that we face uh, in, in just in our humanity. And let me explain, um, kind of before I get into the message. I don't know if you ever heard of, there's an author, he's recently passed away maybe a year ago. His name is René Girard, uh, a French guy. And he wrote a lot about what's called mimetic desire. Mimetic desire, just, I just want to kind of go over this briefly. Mimetic desire is this idea that we, we all believe that our desires come from within us. But what, what we're learning about ourselves is that actually our desires come from one another. Uh, that's why it's called mimetic desire. We, and, and, and the thing about mimetic desire is that it is, um, it is actually, their learning is actually uh, uh, biological and pre-rational. Anybody know what I'm talking about, biological and pre-rational? This is happening at a level that it's, it's, it's not in your conscious mind, okay? Uh, that you believe that your desires are emanating from within you. And they found this to be true actually even in newborn infants. So I've, I've told this story before, but imagine, uh, you probably, you've seen this before, especially if you work with young children, right? Uh, you put a two-year-old in a room, and they're playing with a toy, and the, to and the room is full of toys. You put another two-year-old in a room, what toy does that two-year-old want? What's well, the exact same toy? This is the, this is the substance, the essence of mimetic desire. And, and all advertisers know this about us. That's why they put, you know, movie stars in the cars that make us want, you know, what the, and we don't, and we don't get it. We think we desire it because the car is desirable or, the, or, or whatever is desirable. But actually, mimetic desire is this idea of desiring what somebody, so it becomes desirable to me because someone else desires it. Does that make sense? So what word is this? This is envy. That's what this is. This is envy. I see something that someone else wants, and so I want that exact same thing. And the, the problem is, is that, is that we don't recognize it, number one. And then that develops into rivalry between us and that person who desires the same thing, especially if there's scarcity in that, in that the object of our desire. And so we rival, you know, uh, envy turns to rivalry. Rivalry leads to ultimately to violence. Rene Girard says this is, the, this is the origins of everything. Think about the stories in the Bible. The first story in the Bible other than Adam and Eve, is who? Cain and Abel. It's a story of mimetic desire. It's a story of rivalry. The very first story that we see in our Bible that, that's here to teach us about life is about mimetic desire and what it leads to. The very first brothers 
because of that, because of envy, of desiring what somebody else has, leads to ultimately to violence, to death. Rene Girard says this is, this is really, our, 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 this is really the, the, the basic problem of all mankind, is this mimetic desire that leads to rivalry, rivalry leads to violence. So I think it's important that we take this seriously, right? The Bible says love does not envy, does not envy. So I think we spent some time talking about it, don't you? We should learn about envy. So uh, first thing we do is we, we have to understand what envy is. I think we talked about that a little bit, wanting what others have. Um, and envy is it's not just desire, but it's desire that leads to resentment. And the trouble with this is, let me just reiterate what I just said. It's biological and pre-rational. So unless you, unless we do some serious, uh, let's call it soul searching, right? Some serious looking into ourselves, we're going to miss it. We're going to think that the desire is just our desire. I desire it because it's something just that I want. And we're going to miss it. And it's going to, and it's going to spiral. It's going to lead to uh, enmity. It's going to lead to violence. And ultimately, it's going to lead to death. Sometimes, I'm going to tell a couple stories. Sometimes actual death. Sometimes the death of, of relationships, right? The death of, uh, of so much in our life. And so we need to take it seriously and to think about it. Um, envy. Envy causes you and I to mourn when others rejoice, right? Because of this desire. It can happen anywhere. It can happen in the home. It can happen between, like I talked about, Cain and Abel. It can happen between siblings, envy. It can happen at work, right? You desire what the other has. You know, why did they get the promotion and I didn't get the promotion, right? It's just, just all through your life, in every single area, it can happen. Students in school, why, why, why am I not more athletic? Why don't, why don't I get the good grades, right? Looking and seeing. It just happens everywhere. Just stop and just think about it in your own life. It happens absolutely everywhere. And we need to pay, learn to pay attention to it. Um, so... Uh, Advertisers take advantage of this and they manipulate us because of that mimetic desire, because of that rivalry. Basically, they say this. They say, uh, if you buy whatever, if you buy our product, if you buy X, you will be the envy of everybody else. That's basically what they're saying, aren't they? Without saying it. If you get this, everybody's going to look at you and go, ah, oh, I wish I had that. I wish I had that also. And it's just so true. And if you'll stop and you'll pay attention to your own self, you'll, you'll realize that as well. Um, there was a study done uh, in, in middle America, in Muncie, Indiana. And they wanted to see uh, what causes people. It's a whole long article. I'm just going to summarize it, okay? It's real simple. Uh, they wanted to see what causes people to buy one product over another, right? Like, why do you buy this toothpaste over this toothpaste? Why do you buy this car over that car? Whatever, whatever it is. So they did this massive research project, right? To figure out why people buy one product over another. And it boiled down to one thing, envy. It boiled down to mimetic desire. What do other people, what are other people desiring? So envy is all over. And I want you to know this, that envy will, will poison your relationships if you let it in. Um, that's why it's in this verse. I, I read in, 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 uh, in preparing for this, I, last night I was reading all kind of articles and everything. There is a story of, uh, this is an absolutely 100% true story. These two girls in high school, they were best friends their entire life. And they both went out for the coveted cheerleading squad. And uh, at, the, at the end, after all, the, after all the, you know, I guess they have practices or whatever they have at the end, one girl made it and the other one didn't. 
the one that didn't made it was so envious, she killed her friend to be on the team. And she got put on the team. No, no one knew how she died until it was found out that she killed her. All over what? Listen, mimetic desire, is, it's real. Envy is real. That's why they call it the big green monster, right? That's, I know my, my printer didn't work too well this morning, but if you see on your front of your notes, the, the green eyes, you know, symbolizing, symbolizing this, this idea of, of envy. I, I, if, you're, if you're a reader and you, and you enjoy that, I, I, would, I would encourage you to pick up something from Rene Girard. It's a little heavy reading. Maybe you could pick up, get online and just look up Mimetic Desire, someone explaining uh, Rene Girard's mimetic theory. I think it'll fascinate you. But envy ruins relationships. Uh, Cain killed Abel because of envy, right? Joseph's brothers, right? They did all this terrible stuff to Joseph. Why? Because of envy. Saul tried to kill David because of why? Envy. What, what was the song they sang? Uh, Saul killed his thousands. David killed his tens of thousands. Saul was jealous. Envy poisons relationships. It kills relationships. So let's just look real quick at three. Uh, I'm going to try to you know, go through this a little, little quicker because I, I want them to sing that song at the end as well. Uh, but three things that, um, that happen uh, when we envy with mimetic desire. Number one is this, is obvious it causes conflict. It causes conflict. There's a, I read another story of a woman who was in her garage, in their freezer, that cleaning out the ice that's been in the freezer for the last two years. How many have to do that as well, right? In the freezer, chipping away, and got some, and the kids were playing around in the, in the, in the garage, and she threw out some ice, and, and one kid started, one child started to play with the ice, and, and the other one said, hey, you know, I want some ice. So she said, okay, she chipped, put in a bucket, threw it out there, playing with it, you know, and then the other one said, hey, you know, she has more ice than me. Okay, chip off some more and throw it out there. And, and what did the other one say? Wait a minute. Now they have more than me. And she's chipping away ice, ice. And, and the kids were out there, ankle deep in ice, complaining about, back and forth, wanting more ice. All along, they're in bare feet. Their, their feet are freezing, hurting them. They're in pain, but they still desire more and more and more until it comes to almost, almost to blows between two siblings over ice, and the, and the mom has to separate them. It's all over. James 4.1 says this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the, your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. James just nails it, doesn't he? From your desires, that battle, that rage within you, from early age on, it causes these problems. There's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an old Jewish uh, folklore story that goes like this. A shopkeeper uh, was very jealous, envious of a shopkeeper just down the road from his store. One day an angel appears to him and says to him, uh, listen, ask for anything that you want, anything at all. Whatever you want is yours. You want a million dollars, it's yours. You ask for whatever you want. And the store owner said, well, well what's the catch? The angel said, well, the only catch is this. Whatever you ask for, whatever you want, the shopkeeper down the road, your, your, your rival, he gets double what you get. And he sat and thought for a minute. I got it. I know what I want. He said, what is it? He said, I want to be blind in one eye. You know, what, what, a, what, what, a, what a telling story, isn't it? That the, that, the, that the lengths that will go because of envy, because of rivalry, because of mimetic desire. 
Envy is absolutely destructive. And envy causes conflict. Two, envy kindles resentment. Envy kindles resentment. Okay, I'm just going to ask you this. Don't try not, to, try not to react with your face. Just think about it. Have you ever, ever in your life had a hard time accepting the success of someone else, especially in your own field? Huh? Hey, I golf with Pete all the time. I have a hard time accepting his success in golf. Hey, I'm just being, hey, laugh all you want. I'm just being honest. It's a hard thing. Now you have to deal, what I'm, what I'm telling you is this. You, you, it's inside of you. That envy, that mimetic desire, right? You know, here's the thing. We always talk about in golf that, that the drive, really, it doesn't mean that much, right? You can have a bad drive and you can recover from a bad drive, right? Somebody can hit the ball 300 yards, somebody hit 250 yards, and after the next shot, they're, they're, they're even, they're equal, right? But something about this, when you get on that tee box, it's, uh, maybe, maybe it has to do with men and not women, I don't know. Somebody get on a tee box and saying, I, 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 I want to be, you know, you get up there to the ball, right? And uh, so Pete and I were playing the other day, and uh, our balls were pretty close. Uh, uh, they were up there on two balls. They were about eight feet apart. And so I pulled up to the first one, you know, I was sitting there, and, and Pete come over, and, and uh, I said something, I said, Pete, you had a super nice drive and everything, right? <laughs> right, Pete? And, uh, and uh, so he got out, he was holding his club or whatever, and he was, he was waiting on me. I go, what are you waiting for? He goes, well, I go, that's your ball. It was one behind. That's your one. I stopped there on purpose. That's your one. What was I saying? Right? It is. It's, it's, this, it's this, that right. Listen, it could happen. Siblings, best of friends, cheerleaders. Friends, this is something we need to take seriously. We need to, need to pay attention to this in our life. Especially, especially if, if mimetic desire, let, let, mimetic desire, envy, especially if it's biological and pre-rational. Talk about danger. Red flags everywhere, isn't it? Red flags everywhere. Pay attention to it in our life. We, and, and it's easy to see in others, isn't it? It's hard to see uh, in ourselves. And so, and, and it's an obvious thing if you're, you know, if you have trouble seeing a colleague experience success. If that, that, that bothers you, understand what's underlying it, what's happening. Why did he get the promotion and I didn't get the promotion? Well, why did they find somebody? I've been looking for somebody for so long. They found somebody and I didn't. Why, why, why? Happens, it happens in so many different places in our life. Why did they get to go to France on vacation and we go to Cleveland? Yeah? Yeah? Let me tell you something. This is, this, is, this, is, this is funny, but this is real. This is absolutely real. I have friends that say to me sometimes, like I, Michelle and I go away two weeks every year. I learned it from a director that I had. Let me tell you something about it. It was a long time before I did it. He said, how many go on one-week vacations? Raise your hand, one-week vacations. After a week, are you ready to go home? No. No. It takes you, how many, how many does it take you to wind down? You're on vacation, you're traveling, you're getting there, you're grocery shopping, you're getting settled, day or two, now you start to get, get a place where you start to wind down, you get the place to wind down, it's time to go home. Start packing up, get ready, and you're gonna go home. He said, take a two-week vacation. That'll give you rest. A one-week vacation, that'll give you rest. So, so I've been practicing that. I have some friends that jokingly with me, my very, very close friends, joking with me, oh, I wish I could do that. And I go, you can. You can. And you should. Right? I'm not, I'm not trying to be a model for it. I don't want you to be jealous. I don't want you to be envious. Right? You can. And you should. You should. For your own, for your own health. And so it happens, and we need to be careful of what, of what we're, uh, of how we're behaving. Um, Titus 3.3 3 says this, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasure. What's it talking about? Talking about desires, desires within us. 
We live in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Another story I want to tell you, there's a story of a small town. There were three churches in this town. One church got a young pastor. And, uh, and people started to really come out to his church, kind of they were really interesting. And he was a dynamic speaker, and for whatever reason. And so, as it happens, and so it just happens, it's just part of the way it is, it's okay. People left the other two churches and went to his church. How do you think it made those two pastors feel? Not too good. Not too good. So then rumors started, and this is a true story. Some rumors started about the young pastor of some, of some impropriety, sexual impropriety. And it wasn't true. It wasn't true. But the two pastors talked and talked to others and go, well, you know, I've seen it before. Right? I've seen it before. These guys, these dynamic speakers, they can't control their, their personal life, and right? And they started to talk like that. And then that pastor started to catch wind of all this, and he just became, you know, timid and, 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 and his presentation anymore. And people started like, what's wrong with him? And he finally ended up leaving the church, leaving ministry altogether. Now let me ask you a question. You think the people that left those churches and went to his church, you think they went back? No, they didn't. Who did it hurt? It hurt everybody. It hurt, it hurt that pastor. It hurt the other two pastors. It hurt the congregants. Listen, envy is destructive. Envy is poison. And unfortunately, I'll say it again, it's biological and pre-rational. We, we tend to think it's not. We, and that's why we don't even see it in ourselves when it happens. I got to move on. Next thing is this. Uh, envy makes me miserable. Envy makes me miserable. Listen to this story. I love this story. I mean, who Chuck Swindoll is. You ever hear Chuck Swindoll? Yeah, very, very famous speaker, pastor, very good. Written a lot of books. You know what I mean? It's very good. He tells a story in one of his books <clears throat> when he was young and dating, just dating. He was dating a woman who eventually becomes his wife. But he's dating her. And, but, but she's kind of still kind of, you know, playing the field, as they say, dating other people. And this is like driving him crazy. And, and they went to, uh, is Texas A&M, is that the Aggies? That's the Aggies? Okay, that's where he went. The Aggies. And uh, uh, and so she's dating these other guys. And he says to her, I don't think you should be. I think that you're exclusively mine. Well, she was like, oh, do you really? You know, so she went to Texas, uh, Texas Aggie game, Texas A&M game with a, another guy. And so, listen, I didn't know this. This is in his book. He tells a story that it's tradition at uh, Aggie's game that when they score, the person you're with, you kiss the person you're with. Just tradition, right? That's just what they do. And so he's, that's his school. And he tells a story that he's at home watching the game. He said, I'm praying for my team to lose. <laughs> Not just lose, be shut out. I'm praying. They won 48 and nothing. <laughs> he said, I was at home just boiling in misery. Why? Envy. Envy. Envy will make you miserable. So, I, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about what's an example for us. Uh, there's plenty of examples in the Bible of envy, of it going bad. But I thought, is there any example of envy, uh, of the opposite of that in the Bible? I was thinking and thinking and thinking, and I, I thought, you know what I thought of? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist had a lot of followers. A lot of people were disciples of John. And, and, and Jesus comes along. And Jesus starts to draw all kinds of crowds. Just think of those pastors in that town. I'm sure that Jesus drew 
uh, disciples of John the Baptist, drew disciples away from John. I, mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I'm, I don't know for 100%, but I'm guessing it's true. But what, it, what, what encapsulated John the Baptist? One phrase, one phrase. He said this. He said, he must increase and I must decrease. He must increase and I must decrease. So the question is this, how, how do we, how do you and I learn to overcome envy? Let me just talk about, let me just go back to mimetic desire again because what Rene Girard says is this, what, what we were meant to get our desires from God. We are meant to like imitate. That's, that's, why, that's why Jesus, when he comes, Jesus says, listen, f- follow me. Be like me. Not, don't look around at everybody else. Be like me. Get your desire from me, from God. They'll be pure. They'll be good. They'll be healthy. And it's not going to lead to rivalry. It's not going to lead to enmity. It's not going to lead to violence. Which is, which is, friends, which is, our, which is our core problem, which is, which is our sin. And envy is this, envy, this mimetic desire, this, 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 this base problem in all of humanity leads to that violent place. Okay, so, I, so there are probably many things. So I came up with four things that I think that we can... Uh, that we can work on in our life, that I can work on, that you can work on, to implement, to help combat rivalry, help combat this, this state that's, 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 you know, overcome the states even biological and pre-rational. First one is this. Resist comparing your drive to someone else's drive, right? Golfing analogy. Resist comparing yourself to others. Resist comparing yourself to others. Because when you do, you're just setting yourself up for trouble. Because here, here, here's what I know to be true. I don't care how good you are at anything that you do, there will always be what? There will always be someone better than you. Always be someone better. We need to practice, practice in our life, not comparing ourselves to others. Listen, you ever buy a new car? You talk about depreciation when you drive off a lot. Let me tell you what depreciates your car more than anything else. Your neighbor buying a newer one than you. <laughs> yeah. That depreciates your car faster and more than anything else. Listen, you, and you know it to be true. Here's the, here's the thing about this. Here's the thing about this. When it's happening, none of us notice it. But all of us look back and go, oh, yeah. Right? Am I right? All, you can look back in your life and you know it's hard to admit it to yourself that you did it out of envy. It's hard to admit. You'll never admit it to anybody else. And it'll, it'll cross your mind. You'll talk yourself out of it. But if you'll take the time to be honest with yourself, you look back, oh, yeah, that was a bad move. That was, that, that was, done. That was, that was wrong motives. That was mimetic desire, right? Next one. Something to, so the first one is resist comparing. The next one is something to remember. Remember that the thing that you're envying, the thing that you're envying does not guarantee happiness. The thing that you're envying does not guarantee happiness. Next time you find yourself desiring something, especially if it's envying something, ask yourself a question. Um, Will this thing, this object that I'm desiring, will it, listen, look at me, look at me for a minute. Will this bring me lasting happiness? Notice I just didn't say happiness. I mean, you're happy when you buy a brand new car. You're happy when you buy a brand new car. Until the first payment rolls around. Then you're not so happy. Until your kids spill a whole thing of Coke in it. 
like happened to us. Remember my story of that? Right, a whole thing of Coke in our car. Brand new car, whole thing of Coke, right? All of a sudden, listen, it's not lasting. Ask yourself, will the thing that I'm desiring, will the thing that I'm envying, will it bring lasting happiness? Once there was a young girl whose parents took her to the, the shrine of the golden arches. There she saw an opportunity to buy a combination of food and a little toy that someone in a fit of marketing genius named the Happy Meal. <laughs> May I have it please, she asked her parents. I must have it. I don't think I can live without it. No, her parents told her, the toy is a trivial little thing that just enabled the price of this package to be raised beyond its, uh, it's what it's really worth and it's not in our budget, we can't do it. But you don't understand, she said. She said, I need to have this Happy Meal. She, know, she knew that it wouldn't just be buying fries, nuggets, and a dinosaur stamp. They would be buying for her happiness. She was convinced that she had a little McVacuum at the core of her soul. <laughs> Our hearts are restless until they find rest in a Happy Meal. So she explained, I want that Happy Meal more than I've ever wanted anything before. And if I get it, parents, you know the line, I'll never ask for anything ever again. No more compl complaining. No more demanding. If you get me the Happy Meal, I'll be content for the rest of my life. So this seemed like a pretty good deal to the parents. So they bought her the Happy Meal. And it worked. It worked. She grew up to be contented, grateful, a joyful woman. She lived with serenity and grace. Her, uh, her life in many ways was hard. The man she married turned out to be a louse and abandoned her with three small children and no money. The kids, too, were a disappointment. They dropped out of school, sponged off her meager, meager resources, and eventually left without a trace. When she was an old woman, Social Security gave out, and she had to live from hand to mouth. But she never complained. She had gotten her happy meal. She would think often, I remember that happy meal, she'd say to herself. What great joy I found there. Just as she predicted, it brought her lasting satisfaction. satisfaction. She was grateful for the rest of her life. Does anything in life work that way? <laughs> There's absolutely nothing in life that works that way. And we need to remember these things in our life. Thing is, we look at that story and we go, <laughs> isn't that ridiculous? Isn't they, aren't kids just, you know, they think a Happy Meal is going to be the thing for them. Our Happy Meals as adults are just way more expensive. Aren't they? They're still Happy Meals. We still think that that's the thing. That's the thing that's going to make me happy. Listen, it even comes in people. I, if, I if I just had a relationship, then I'd be happy. Don't, don't believe that either. Don't believe that either. If you do, that's called codependency. Okay? You need to learn to be happy and content within yourself. Don't look, don't look for others to bring, you, to bring you your happiness. Don't look for other things to bring you your happiness. We have Happy Meals. Okay. You know, it was so funny. I was sitting last night. Uh, Michelle wasn't there. I was sitting there, and the dogs were outside. I mean, we have two. I guess you call them dogs, and we let them in. They're more like just wild beasts. And uh, you know, I let them in. They're, they're in the house, right? And, and, they, and I'm sitting there working on my computer, you know, at our, our table. And they're, they're, they're like wrestling with each other, and they're playing with each other. Finally, they settle down, right? They settle down. And one settles down at my feet, and the other one's over there. And so I put my foot out, and I'm, I'm just I'm typing away. Kind of, I'm, I'm a... Petting a dog's therapeutic, isn't it? 
I was petting his dog. Uh, I'm the one, my, you know, my, my leg starts to go like this, you know. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, the other one I see, sees my foot. Oh my God. Pandemonium. Man, come over, this one's barking, that one, this one stands up. They're trying to get closer to me, they're climbing up on top of me. I'm thinking, even in, even in dogs, like even in animals, right? Envy, mimetic desire, it is just absolutely all over. Listen to this. One of the wise, reportedly, okay, I didn't know him, but reportedly one of the wisest men that ever lived, Solomon. Solomon said that, that, um, that he, he denied himself nothing, and he had money. Anything that he wanted, he, he got for himself. And, listen, let, me, let me just put it this way. Let me put it this way. Anything that you have ever envied or will envy, he had. Okay? Let's, let's put it that way. Now, obviously, the time difference. He didn't have an iPod. or I, I get that, right? You know what I'm saying? Anything that anybody would desire, he had in that, in that time. If he lived today, he would be the Bill Gates. Anything he wants, anything that you would desire, he had. He said this, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, wait for it, here it is, everything was meaningless. It was all meaningless a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Reportedly, the wisest man that ever is telling you and I, listen, it, it, it's, it's not, what you seek is not found in anything, any object. It's not found in it. Whatever anybody else has, your happiness is not found there, does not lie there. He, he had every happy meal. Every happy meal he had, Solomon. And he said, it's all meaningless. It's all meaningless. Listen to this, Richard uh, Corey. Uh, this is a story of Richard Corey, written, it's a poem written by Edwin Arlington Robinson. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentle man from soul to crown, clean favored and impartially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed, and he was always human when he talked. But still he fluttered pulses when he said good morning, and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than any king, and ad admirably schooled in every grace. In fine, we thought that he was everything to make us wish we were in his place. So we worked and we waited for the light and went without the meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet in his head. You know, friends, people that have things have to make it look like that those things make them happy, make them content. Don't, don't buy that either. Don't buy that. I'm not saying they're not happy. But I know this. It's not the things that make them happy. If they're happy, if they've found happiness and contentment, they found it outside of those things. And that's what Solomon is trying to tell us as well. Number three is this. Number three, learn to do this. Learn to rejoice in what you do have. Rejoice in what you do have. Be happy in what you do have. Remember, teach yourself that every day is a gift. Just enjoy life. Enjoy life being a gift. Enjoy every minute of it. And number four, because I'm going to have the band come up here right now if you can, get ready. Number four is this. 
goes back to Pete's, Pete's saying, you know, way to be you, remember, re, or realize, remember, realize that you are unique, that you are unique. There is not another you. Pete and I were out the other day, and, and uh, we were in a smoothie place, and this guy comes out and looks at us and goes, hey, are you two guys brothers? I said, no, we've been getting that our whole life, right? People think we look so much alike. But you know what? We, Pete and I, as much as we're alike, we are so different. Why? Because everybody's different. Because you're unique. And if you don't be you, who will be you? Who will be you? Realize you're a unique person. The qualities, characteristics, everything about you is unique to you. I think if you look back through your notes, you look at these four things, and you could probably think of, of many more. Let me just... Just real quick, I won't read the whole story, but there's a story of Itzhak Perlman, you know, the, the violinist, right? Uh, he had polio when he was a kid. And so he uh, has, a, you know, a crutches or a wheelchair. He's an unbelievable violinist. And there's a story uh, told of him. I don't know if it's true or not, but a story told of him that, you know, he, he you know, uh, came out onto the stage and crutches and you know it was it was hard for him to get out there and everything and he starts playing with this orchestra right and the conductor starts he starts playing and as he's playing as he gets into it however long a string breaks on his violin and everything stops and so he pauses and he closes his eyes and uh, let me just let me get his line right and then he uh, he he opened his eyes, looked at the conductor. Well, he put his finger like this first, closed his eyes, looked at the conductor, nodded his head to start. And so he started playing, and he finished the entire thing um, on his violin with three strings. And let me see if I can find the line in here. I should have read it, because I would have come right across the line. Um, he said this. He said, you know, sometimes it's the artist's task to find out how much music you can still make with what you have left. Boy, what a, what a, what a, even if it's not a true story, what a great parable, isn't it? Because he lived, it, well, this wasn't about, that, that line, it wasn't about mu- just about music, was it? He had polio. What will you do? Listen, you, you, we've been given so much. And you don't, and you don't appreciate anything until some, a piece is gone, is missing, Right? Like the string. And we could say, oh, it's, you know, it's, now it's broke. Now I can't do anything. I have to fix that. What will you do with what you have, basically? What will you do with what you have left? Because here's the thing. Look around the room. Look around. Look around everybody. No one's perfect. No one's perfect. Some of you think you're close, but you're not. No one's perfect. And so I think that if we'll, if we'll, if we'll really think about these things and, and, and so I, it's just, honestly, it's, life just takes practice, doesn't it? It just takes practice. Look at these things. I'm going to practice these things in my life. Because why? Because envy kills. Envy destroys. Don't let it happen to you.